going to ask you to forgive me an indulgence, which is uh, to reflect upon our work through the lens of Utzon. Um, and I, I said to Louise yesterday, who, who arranged the, a magical tour of this extraordinary building for me, we had a lovely conversation, and I said to her that uh, in many ways our firm wouldn't be possible without the likes of Utzon. That in fact, we very humbly stand on the shoulders of a set of, I think, uh, a very specific group of modernists, uh, like Utzon, like Alto, like Saarinen, what uh, many have sort of called the humanist modernists. And it's interesting that as we came out of school, we understood architectural history through this path. You know, that, that we as a profession started as craftsmen and journey, journeymen. I use the word the tectonics of 21st century urbanism in uh, my title and tectonics, of course, for, you know, it is, it's interesting. It's both a Latin and a Sanskrit word that talks about the idea of the carpenter architect, the master builder. Um, and so, this idea that we start as craftsmen, we come through the age of the Enlightenment, and then of course, and I believe that this break right here is World War I. Some might differ with me, but that basically the ravages of World War I, the technology of World War I, gives birth to the modernists, the high modernists that we think about, uh, Gropius, Corbusier, and so forth. Um, I believe in that arrow, is kind of the break where suddenly you see a, another group, Alto, uh, Hertzberger, Van Eyck, uh, break away somewhat from that pure, extraordinarily rationalist vision of the future. Um, but it is this that becomes the main line of modernism, and to the point where by the time we're in school in the 90s, there is this very firm division between the sort of paper theoretical architect and the service architect that goes out and builds corporate buildings. Um, and we very much wanted to reject both of those paradigms. We felt that we wanted to build, and that we, in order to build, we needed to understand uh, this industry. And if you understood this industry, you understood that it uh, rests very much within a series of sort of concentric circles of mediocrity. Um, that we have allowed that master builder role. And I believe architects have largely done this to themselves. Uh, by, you know, we found ourselves as young architects going to meetings where when it came to the big issues of where's the right site, what's the financial formulation for the project, what are the political issues that swirl around the project, well, those are for the adults <laughs> that make those decisions before the architect gets in the room, right? And then the other side of the equation in terms of building and contracting, where we literally had senior architects telling us, well, there are insurance liabilities and they're all, you can't get involved in those means and methods of construction. And so we started to operate on a narrower and narrower bandwidth that we, as a group of people, really felt was incorrect, that we needed to be expansive in our profession, particularly in light of the challenges that cities face today. And so we tried to create an idea of being a sort of a both and practice, that it wasn't about a master genius at the top. It was uh, a number of partners that we were both uh, teachers in the academy and uh, uh, had a sense that uh, we, like all architects do, must be guardians of culture uh, versus this notion that we must be responsible to our clients and must be able to build responsibly with budgets uh, and, and uh, the ability to deal within a political spectrum. We said, well, how are we going to do that? It's great to be able to say it. Uh, but how are we going to do it given the existing paradigm of architecture? And one of the things we wanted to do is look outside of our fields. And one of the interesting things about our, uh, uh, about our partners is we all come from very, very different backgrounds before we studied architecture. And we started looking at everything from biology uh, to aeronautics and understanding how, you know, there are clues here. There is a way in which things are transformed in order to be performative, a very big word from the 1990s, that design actually had a sort of performance equation to it. And we looked at things like the airline industry and the automotive industry, which built in a fundamentally different way than the construction industry, uh, which in my mind is still stuck somewhere between the 16th and the 17th century uh, in terms of how uh, delivery of construction takes place. And this notion that the beauty of architectural, it, architecture actually derives from its performance, right? That every piece is there for a very specific set of reasons having to do with how it performs. And I want to 
stress that that is not the same as form follows function. It is more than that. Performance has uh, subjective criteria as well as objective criteria. So how, how it performs in the city, how it feels are part of its performance values, not simply a rational sum of parts. Uh, uh, and so we said if you looked at that master builder idea and how it is one thought about the construction of complex geometries and so forth, could you look to 21st century technology as we were entering the 21st century to actually say, well, there are different ways of building. Uh, there are different ways of uh, manufacturing the construction of things. Uh, and also, as we looked at that technological idea at one level, that performance idea, we also had to confront the issues facing the city. And one of the first quotes that I put up here is that for Utzon, for excuse me, for Utzon, and forgive me, I am not a linguist like Louise, my pronunciation is terrible. Uh, there is no essential difference between a city organism and a plant organism. And this test is, is a very inspirational thought. And this is one of our first projects, a cultural project. This was uh, a competition in uh, the, the uh, courtyard of PS1 MoMA uh, where we were, uh, we basically thought about constructing an urban beach. This is in the middle of the summer, not for people with summer homes, uh, but for you know, young kids in Brooklyn mainly. Um, and we started looking at, well, like that model airplane kit, could there be a kit of parts? Could this perform in various ways for various things? And could we start to use the computer? And this is one of the things I'm going to try to stress throughout uh, the morning in my talk, is I, I'm, I'm so uh, immersed in the history of how this building was constructed and the challenges. And, and Louise talked about the struggle. And I, I keep thinking about, well, if Utzon had the technology that we have today, what, how would that struggle have been different? Uh, as we entered the late 90s, we realized, and this is sort of before Revit, um, but certainly the, the entry into BIM building information management, that we could use computers to design buildings in a different way and actually with an analog to the aeronautic industry. And that you could build fairly complex geometries using the computer in a way that was cost effective. And so that was a series of drawings that set up kind of the kit of parts for this uh, project in the way, and very simple joinery, actually. Uh, and then it was built, and an extraordinarily successful, this, this little urban beach had over a million visitors that summer at PS1, and it really was the launching pad for SHOP. Uh, when the mayor of Greenport, Long Island, uh, a small village on Long Island, called us and said, we need a new waterfront and asked us to design a series of follies along that waterfront, including, including uh, a new carousel, uh, a new promenade, a visitor center, and one of our favorite pieces, a camera obscura. For those of you who don't remember what a camera obscura is, it's sort of like a periscope. You go into a dark room and it shows you the world around you in, in 360 degrees. And um, we again started looking, using the computer, looking at that kit of parts, um, understanding how it could be fabricated. And in fact, this won a, an award from the Cooper Hewitt, and um, this is in our office right now. This is a scaled version, because the computer generated this basically based on our inputs, of every single piece that went into that camera obscura. This, this piece hangs on our wall. It's probably about twice the size of that screen. But essentially, it's scaled down, and it could be replicated in that way. Uh, this is that camera obscura out in the field. Uh, it sits out there today. At, like going there with my son. Uh, it's, it's kind of fun. And that's uh, that waterfront. And it was based on that waterfront project that after 9-11, Shop started working on a much bigger waterfront, the East River waterfront uh, in lower Manhattan, a kind of extraordinary place, but actually reminds me very much of this question you have about the Kyle Expressway right here. Uh, because we, too, have an elevated viaduct. There are a series of broken links, blockages that existed at the time when we were asked to look at this. Um, the city was disconnected uh, from the waterfront by this elevated highway. Um, and we said, well, if you took out all the parking, added landscape, added bikes and activity, and then added program, and this is cultural program actually, not big culture, but basically these small pavilions that would inhabit the underside of the freeway and use that viaduct as a ceiling. Um, where performances could take place and it, that culture would go out and extend into the city. Um, that you could basically recreate that or uh, transform that urban experience of walking past those pavilions and out onto a new pier and a new waterfront. Uh, so this waterfront exists today. It's out there. It's very popular. 
Uh, it's uh, beautifully landscaped by a landscaped architect named Ken Smith. Uh, these bar stools are among the most popular things on the water, although you can't have a beer there, unfortunately. It's the States. We're very Puritan. Um, uh, it's very active at night. You see the viaduct has been lit up at night. So it wasn't this tremendous expense of burying the highway and all of those kinds of things, but really reusing that infrastructure much as the High Line was reused. And so you see this new public pier that's out there. This was built for the city on a very low budget. Uh, and one of the issues was you couldn't expand the pier into the water. The regulations didn't allow it. So we double-decked the pier. Um, and um, so there's a wonderful, uh, this is one of the most romantic places in New York City. If you can't get a kiss here, then you really have a problem. Um, <laughs> and uh, we thought about this almost as the kind of underside of a whale. And you see again that joinery. Um, and uh, again, uh, so you see this is lit up beautifully at night. There are sort of small-scale performances that happen out here. Uh, and it's become quite an addition to the waterfront. So we were very invested in those forms of public space. At the same time, we were interested in building density in the city. And this is a project, this is one of our first residential projects where we were actually co-developed this project and had an equity position with the developer. We helped the developer figure out how to transfer air rights from an adjacent landmark building. Um, we wanted to place a zinc facade on the building, and all the contractors said, no, 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 it's much too expensive. It's going to cost $150, $200 a square foot. It's way out of budget. So we flew to France and bought the zinc. Um, and we generated a computer program that figured out how to break up those plates of zinc so that you had as little waste as possible in terms of the plates of zinc. Um, these are them out in the field. The way these are, this is, again, like that model airplane. Uh, for a construction worker out in the field to be able to understand which uh, uh, panel goes next to which panel. And it's, so it's etched, that, that etching is still out there. Uh, and so there are numerous parts in what is essentially a fairly simple um, uh, uh, window wall system uh, that sits above that landmark, including some integrated lighting, which is those white bars. And what's interesting is when this building was built, this part of town, this is 15th and 9th, it was still filled with sort of prostitution and drugs and so forth. Um, about, and I don't, this isn't causal, but about five years later, Google purchased this building. This is Google's headquarters in New York, this landmark behind it, uh, for $1.8 billion. It was one of the most significant real estate transactions in the city uh, that year. And we like to think that our little lantern played a little role in that transaction, although we didn't get any of the money. Um, <coughs> So in reading about it, and I'm going to try to sprinkle these quotes throughout, and, and it's actually it's amazing how little is truly written about the man, uh, especially about his role, as, uh, role in cities. So someone who's a true scholar out there on Utsin, I think you've got a hole to fill. Uh, but uh, of course, Ken Frampton, one of my colleagues at Columbia, has written extensively about him. And he responded to the idea that he responded to this challenge of this building uh, with a profound sense of what was required uh, both to form the building and to transform the site. And I find this to be uh, of fundamental importance in terms of Utsin's legacy here. Um, I, I was telling Louise that uh, as my plane landed in Sydney, the captain of the plane said, to your right is the Sydney Opera House. And I thought to myself, what other 20th century building does a captain of a plane point out as a plane is landing? Uh, it is extraordinary. And that is the idea of transforming the site. It is not just about the architecture itself. And so it's, again, it's these, sh these shoulders that we try to humbly stand on. And this was a project that came to us uh, in dire straits. This was designed by Frank Gehry. Uh, this was an arena in downtown Brooklyn and a remaking of downtown Brooklyn, uh, led by a developer. And what happened is uh, the, uh, the new sports arena was nestled in the heart of four new skyscrapers, and all the foundations were intertwined. And uh, I've learned that the acronym for this here in Australia is the GFC. Uh, the GFC hits uh, the global financial crisis. And what happens is the developer can finance the arena, but they can't finance the towers around the arena. And so Frank's design is really, which was a brilliant design, uh, is really under challenge. And so they go to Frank and they say, we need you to re redesign this and we need you to do it very, very quickly because of our financing. And Frank says, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Um, and so the developer in a rush goes to a sports architect and they realize that they have very little time to order steel and they want to recreate what's known as the Indianapolis Fieldhouse in Brooklyn. 
Uh, Amanda Burden, then city planning chair, somehow looks at this drawing and then mysteriously it ends up on the front page of the New York Times a couple of days later. And we say, really, can our city do better than this? Um, and so uh, the developer called us. We were very skeptical. Uh, my partner Greg used to work for Frank Gehry and so called Frank and said, you know, how do you feel about us working on it? And we got the kind of papal dispensation. Uh, and we started looking at this very rough and tough field house and we said, well, how can we break this thing down and make it urban? Um, and so we started doing some early sketches about how it would interact with the city and how it could make a kind of structural extension out into the city. The fact that it had bands that were concourses but other areas that could be transparent. And of course, this is always the thing about an urban arena and it's not dissimilar to an opera house, that it often tends to be quite blank on the pedestrian levels. And it's interesting the interventions that you've made to create kind of more pedestrian activity around the edges of, um, uh, of this building. And this was, I think, very much the emphasis here of how to get views in and out of the building and how to make it feel public and porous. Um, and then this was the big move, a big structural cantilever that extended out towards the mass transit system and out into a new urban plaza so that one came, when, 11 subway lines converge here. There's not a single parking space for this building. So that one, when one came out of the mass transit, one can immediately peer through the building and look at the scoreboard. Um, and that as one uh, came out of that plaza, that one would get light through this great oculus. And as one moved around the arena, they weren't facing blank walls, but they were facing retail, looking into practice courts and so forth. We started looking at the history of Brooklyn and the materiality of Brooklyn. And you know, Utzon, of course, he had that famous quote about Sydney being a dark harbor, and it was part of his logic for why to make the white sails. And we looked uh, at the materiality of Brooklyn and realized that here it was really about the industrial nature of Brooklyn that was very important. So we started thinking about a Corten steel facade. Um, that's the building as it sits out there today. This is the uh, 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 transit stop, and then that's that great oculus. Um, and so if you start pulling apart this building, what you realize again that the use of the computer in forming those bands uh, was very critical and that these reaches out into the city were uh, of critical importance to us. And uh, I've been looking a lot at Utzon's church, the Bravesguard Church, and thinking about things like, you know, there are no new ideas, right? So for instance, the Oculus here in the garden and this big Russian section, whoops. That big Russian, the section of the church. Uh, and I think these are the kinds of things that influence us as we go into the 21st century and look at different systems of how those bands could get created with the use of the computer and of course, on this church, Utzon used prefabricated panels, as I'm sure you all know. Uh, and that sense of prefabrication and how to build things differently has been very much an inspiration for us. Um, there are 12,000 different panels on this building. Each are mega panels that fit on a truck uh, and uh, are built as a rain screen on top of the building. These are folded panels that we design now by the time Revit is actually uh, in full use. Uh, and looked at how those panels could uh, go directly from the drawing board to the manufacturer as a piece of laser cutting and bending. Uh, it's Corten steel, Corten tends to rust. Um, so for about three months, this went through, these panels went through dry cleaning racks that essentially pre-rusted them. It's like a pre-washed jean uh, to get as much rust out of them as possible. And then each piece was tagged and controlled uh, and there is an iPhone app that we created so that uh, anyone from a construction worker to the owner of the development company could uh, scan a, a construction piece and understand where it fit in the overall uh, project. Uh, and so this was how this was constructed. That's the rain screen going up. And then, of course, there's this heroic structural moment in the front, and it immediately reminds me again of one of Ken's quotes, that Utzon Sydney proves the point that a tectonic concept and a structurally rational work may not necessarily coincide. And I think this is very important. So the, the, so the idea of the tectonics here, and I, I am very hesitant to tell you things that I'm sure you know and have studied in great detail about this building. But this notion of the tectonic, the roof form floating over the stereotomic, that, that Gottfried Semper idea of that separation, 
that that is not the same thing as structural rationality. And for us, this is extremely important. Again, it is not about form simply following function, but the idea that form actually has a performance value in terms of how one experiences it in the city. And so as this went up, uh, you know, it was <laughs> it's a pretty significant cantilever out there uh, to build that oculus. I, I couldn't help but, and forgive me for such a audacious comparison, but I just couldn't help but think about the challenges in building this versus that crazy cantilever that's sitting out there in Brooklyn with the uh, panels that in some ways, in my mind, equate to the tiles, uh, how that acts at night and becomes a transformative action in the heart of the city. Um, and then just to close a little bit on this building with the interior, because we design the interior to be a black box theater. Uh, the way we kind of uh, conceptualize sports in this instance, um, although I was told that Melbourne was the bigger sports city than Sydney, and, and I find the Melbourne-Sydney comparisons absolutely fascinating, and so, but I'm still gonna talk about a sports metaphor here in the sense that we, we really felt that the true nature of sports is sports is like going to a performance. It's like going to a theater. The only difference is that you don't know the ending. Uh, and so that we really wanted to conceptualize this this way as this black box theater. And these are the critics that we really cared about. Um, the, either the basketball player, uh, now hockey players as well, or uh, the performers who work there. It's fun to play in. The floor is dope. The arena is dope. It's a cool place to play. And then Mick Jagger in one of the most extraordinary uh, performances I've ever seen. Uh, hey, Brooklyn, this is really one beautiful building. Now that, that is performative in my mind. That is what uh, uh, one lives for as an architect. Uh, and so this is part of a larger development project that's uh, filled with lots and lots of rental housing and uh, a great deal of affordable housing, as I discussed the other night, uh, uh, this 50, 30, 20 model of 50% affordable, 50% market rate. And the first of these buildings is going up right now. Uh, and uh, these are large buildings. It's about 170,000 square meters in three buildings. And as um, I mentioned the other night, that these buildings are prefabricated. They are being built with modular construction uh, in a nearby Navy yard. Uh, they're being built with union labor. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the CEO, Marianne Gilmartin of uh, Forest City Ratner, is one of the most brilliant people I ever met. She did these union negotiations. Um, and what we really did is we worked in parallel. They asked us to have two teams that looked at conventional construction versus prefabricated construction to test which was the more logical and efficient way to go. And they took this very brave step forward of saying, no, even though it's experimental, we're going to build the tallest modular building in the world. And the reason we want to do that is we believe that there's a 20% uh, construction cost savings, including the time savings associated with it, which was about six months, uh, which is very big if you understand the carry on the cost of the land, um, but that also the quality would be higher. Um, and so we started this process of understanding how this could get built. We worked with, again, Overup uh, on uh, the structural system, and uh, there's actually one major piece of patent innovation here that Overup holds, which is how these modules click together and mate in terms of both structure and the mechanical and engineering systems. Uh, these are the modules. They fit on the back of a flatbed truck. They come together. They don't necessarily define a room. Uh, in other words, one can combine these and get a living room. Uh, they also don't necessarily have to be boxes. This architecture was meant to be more rectilinear in contrast to the arena. Uh, but they don't have to be as boxy as they are in this particular uh, deployment. Uh, so this is the, and then the exterior enclosure comes on. And then down at the street, it feels like a fairly normal building with shops and so forth. In the interior, it feels quite normal. Um, the walls are a bit thicker, which we think is a good thing in terms of privacy. But the key here is that, of course, if you're an electrician, you install your electrical conduit uh, 22 degrees on a factory floor instead of 34 stories up in the air uh, in minus 3 degrees. Uh, and so there was a lot of reasons that labor went with this. Um, the other thing is I think that you can't ever, as we talk about globalization, uh, discount the power and the joy of the local. This is all made in Brooklyn. This is the first module coming to this site. And the sense that this was all part of this community was incredibly important. 
Um, I'm going to close by talking about our next generation of work and kind of the work that's not built yet. Um, and Mark Wigley, uh, the dean of my school, with whom I very, very rarely disagree, uh, but in this particular case, who's lectured extensively on Hudson uh, and has talked about the myth of the global architect. Um, and uh, I, I don't quite agree with him in terms of his conclusions here, but this, I think, is a very uh, prescient line, that every architect is a foreigner a tourist who sees invisible clues in his environment and makes them visible through representation. Uh, I, I think this is true of all designers. That, and part of why you know, a crazy Danish architect can make a crazy sketch and send it halfway around the world and actually believe that he's interpreting the place uh, through his sense of representation. That even in our own cities, we walk around so, at some level as foreigners representing the future. Um, so this is uh, uh, some of our work in Botswana. This is for the government of Botswana. Uh, this is a tech center that sits outside of the airport and there Botswana is going long on technology. Uh, and what's interesting here is this building is all about the very, very different environmental conditions of the savanna. Um, and it's interesting, I was reading that Utsun had a great desire to maintain vegetation in place whenever there was vegetation, certainly true at Bravesguard. Here as well, we we're trying to keep uh, all the existing trees and build around those trees as part of the natural landscape. And then in terms of patterning, um, that Botswana has this extraordinary tradition of basket weaving uh, and with extraordinarily in intricate pattern making, uh, almost fractal in its nature. And we looked at this very much in terms of, and we actually analyzed these, scanned these, put these into our computer systems, ran grasshopper models on them, and started to generate pattern making for the interiors of the project, showed mock-ups to the client. Um, and the client very much liked this particular pattern, and it's used in different parts of the building. This building's under construction right now. Um, and this is, of course, going back to that very first slide about the modernist visionaries, and of course, you, I'm sure you've all led your Adolf Loos and ornament is a crime and all of that, um, but you know, then you walk around a building like this and you understand the absolute power of the ornamentation that Utsun was focused on. And so for us, we, we, we don't see ornament as a crime. We actually think it's a very important part of the human experience of a building like this that sits uh, out uh, in the middle of the desert. But it also, uh, excuse me, the Savannah, but it also can apply just as well in the heart of midtown Manhattan. This is a luxury residential tower that sits between 6th and 7th Avenue uh, facing Manhattan. It will be taller than the Empire State Building. It will also be the skinniest building in the world with an aspect ratio of about 1 to 23. Uh, each unit will be a floor. You'll come off that elevator and you will look right and you will see all of Central Park before you. Uh, you will look left. Uh, and you will see all of Midtown Manhattan before you. Of course, in order to do that, you need about 30 or $40 million. Um, but I, I'm actually very proud of this work, and I will tell you why, because there's a very good person that that billionaire um, will live a far more environmentally conscientious lifestyle living in this tower than they will in you know a thousand square meter house in Greenwich, Connecticut out in the burbs with eight or nine Ferraris. And so um, we're happy to do this work and we think it's part of our charge as architects. What's interesting is this one sits right next to a heritage building, the Steinway building, a very important building in our city. And we went to the Landmarks Commission and said, listen, we can build the building right next to the landmark without any approvals. And we think that's a horrible condition. Um, and so we would like to push the tower back, expose the landmark to the street, and for that we need approvals. Uh, we gained unanimous approvals from the Landmarks Commission and the Community Board. Um, this is how the tower meets the ground with a sort of grand retail base, uh, extraordinary atrium, and then the tower shoots up from that. Um, the zoning requires a series of setbacks, and one of the things we started looking at is what are the aspects that a New Yorker feels joyous about when they look at a skyscraper. And it's often that it's slender. It's often a celebration of the setback. If you think of the Woolworth Building, where our office is, the Empire State Building, the Chrysler Building, they all have these beautiful setbacks. 
Um, and that they're material, they're solid. They're not all glass buildings that could land in Dubai or Shanghai or anywhere. They're of the place. So we started playing with that feathered setback form, the materials, started understanding that from the sky, could you again transform the place in terms of the, ex uh, excuse me, the experience of that building? Um, and so this is the proportion. And we started again using the computer to look at terracotta, a beautiful, classic, traditional New York material, uh, but used in a 21st century deployment. Uh, that's the full-scale mock-up of that wall. That's one of our employees standing next to that mock-up. Uh, and that's what it will appear like when you look up. It will have this extraordinary vertical thrust, this great depth and shadow, and it's terracotta with a bronze underlay. Uh, and so we're very excited about this. This building is now under construction, looking at various patterns and so forth. Uh, it will have this uh, magical, almost James Terrell moment in the sky as the southern sun, because we're, of course, in the northern hemisphere, uh, shines down through it and through into Central Park. And we're looking at the top of that building. Um, and we keep laughing about that scene in Raiders of, the Lark, Raiders of the Lost Ark when Indiana Jones puts the staff down and the light comes through it and shines on Tavern on the Green or something. I'm not sure exactly where it's going to shine. But we're very excited about what this top will appear like from the park. Um, and so that's that building in the skyline meant to be kind of effervescent. Um, and then I'm just going to just close with this last quote from Utzon himself. Uh, because yes, as architects, we have all sorts of very serious responsibilities. We must address the nature of our cities and how we build more density, how to integrate culture into our cities, how to build with uh, sustainability and so forth. Uh, the other night I talked about civic delight, and I'm, I'm going to close this with this great quote, that if you look at a building purely from the sensation of joy it gives you, then you're in close contact with what the architect was aiming at. Um, I think we can forgive what's in his dangling participle and focus on the fact that when you walk around this building as a completely lay person who may have no design training, but if you start to understand just the joy of the way in which the light shines off the concrete here, um, each little element, that that is also part of our charge as architects. And one of the things that I think is fundamental to what we do. So I would argue in these kind of last slides, uh, we're starting to build an extension of the Warhol Museum in New York, uh, looking at materials, looking at an extension of, from a subway line of a great food market, looking at a new train station, looking at a new skyline for Brooklyn, looking at a great civic plaza for Brooklyn. That, that what would Utzon do now? He would probably do exactly what he did uh, so many years ago. He would be brilliant, but he would be trying to solve the problems we confront in our society today with the technology and the tools that we have at our disposal. Thanks so much. It was an honor. Thank you.